night. Hello and welcome to this live Colorado Paratella Town Hall. Thank you for being on our live forum. We'll get started in just a few minutes here. Thank you to those of you who dialed in early on our, tele on our inbound participant line. We appreciate you being on. If you already have a question in mind, you can submit that now by pressing zero on your phone. Again, welcome to this live Colorado Para Telephone Town Hall. We'll be getting started in just a moment. Tonight, we'll be providing you with an update about our recently released 2019 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, or CAFR. We also want to answer your questions, so simply press zero to submit a question to an operator. We'll start taking your live questions from members in just a few minutes here. In case you need it, a full recording of this conversation will be posted on our website next week. To find that recording, you can visit www.copara.org slash townhall. Again, that's www.copara.org slash townhall. We'll post the recording there after this live event tonight. We're looking forward to this conversation. We appreciate you participating. Thanks again for staying tuned. I'll be turning it over in just a moment here to Patrick von Kieseling, the Senior Director of Communications here at Colorado Para. He'll be getting us started with the live forum. We are dialing out to 222,600 households around the state. We appreciate your patience. I'll turn it over to Patrick to get us started in just a few seconds here. For those of you who have just joined us, again, this is a live Colorado Para Teletown Hall. If you have a question you'd like to submit, you can do that by pressing zero. Now or at any time during our forum, we'll be providing you with an update about our recently released 2019 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, or CAFR. We want to answer your questions as well, though, so as you're listening, be thinking about questions you'd like to submit for the live Q&A portion of this forum. As soon as you have a question you want to submit, press zero, give your question to an operator. You'll have the opportunity to ask your question live, and we'll be getting an answer from our assembled panel here today. So once again, thank you for joining us. Press zero to submit a question. We're going to go ahead and get started now. I'll turn it over here to the Senior Director of Communications for Colorado Pat Para. That's Patrick Von Kieseling. Please go ahead, Patrick. Thank you, Ian, and thank you, everyone, for joining the Colorado Para Telephone Town Hall. Again, my name is Patrick Von Kieseling. I'm the Senior Director of Communications, and we're here to give you an update about our recently released 2019 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, also known as the CAFR, as well as to discuss our business in these turbulent times. Most importantly, we're here to answer your questions. So let me give you some directions on how to do just that. Right now, you all are in listen-only mode, which means you can hear me, but I cannot hear you. If you would like to ask a question, simply press zero. We'll start taking your questions in just a few minutes. And in case you need it, a full recording of this conversation will be posted on our website next week. To find that recording, visit www copera.org slash town hall. And we're looking forward to our conversation today that will help you understand what's happening at Para and what it means for your retirement security. Again, if you're joining us, I'm Patrick Von Kaiserling, Senior Director of Communications at Colorado Para, and we're here to talk about the 2019 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report and answer your questions. Please press zero if you have a question at any time during this call. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Seated next to me is Ron Baker, the Executive Director of Colorado Para, and Amy McGarity, our Chief Investment Officer. Welcome to you both, and would you please take a moment to introduce yourselves? Thank you, Patrick. Uh, I am Ron Baker. I'm Colorado Para's Executive Director, and I've been with Para for, it'll be 26 years in September. Uh, it's been my honor to, to work for this organization for a long time. I started as an application developer, computer programmer. Uh, and my most recent position before uh, being selected as Executive Director was Chief Administrative Officer. Uh, I'm looking forward to this, this afternoon to answering your questions and talking about the results of our 2019 uh, financials. Uh, before we get to that, though, I would like to uh, have Amy McGarity introduce herself. Thanks, Ron. I'm Amy McGarity, Para's Chief Investment Officer. I've been with Para for over a decade and have been in my current role overseeing our investments program since 2017. I'm very happy to have the chance to speak with you all today. Okay, Ron, before we dig into the highlights of the annual financial report, perhaps you can start by giving us a brief overview. What is the report and why are we having a town hall about it? Great. Thank you. We're, we do this every year as a, as a way for us to notify the members on, of our financial status uh, each year. Our, our financial annual financial report is put out in June. And uh, we usually have these town halls in July to give us uh, an opportunity to 
to basically give our membership an update on where we stand in our financials, what our funded status looks like, where we're looking at in terms of making progress towards being fully funded by 2047, which was the goal of the, the legislation that was passed in 2018. So as important as it is to, to walk through this financial information, it is a, a yearly snapshot. It is, cut, it is, again, where we are at in terms of member statistics and our investment program at any given year. We do this measurement uh, as an ongoing look towards a long-term goal of being fully funded over time. Uh, so we want to, again, the questions that we do this is so that we can uh, let our members know where we are each year. Uh, you, it is your fund. We are your fiduciaries. It is, it, we are letting you know how your uh, pension system is doing. And that's why we have the, these town halls to answer your questions and, again, to let you know where we sit on that path towards full funding. And because it is a snapshot in time, how much emphasis should our members and retirees put into each year's CAFR? Uh, it's, it's, uh, because it is a snapshot, it's important to know where we stand and know what our investment program is doing to look at our, our expenses, to know uh, trends in our demographics. Uh, so it's an important uh, piece of information, but it is really our way to measure ourselves year on year towards an ongoing goal to, to reaching full funded. And, and when we reach a fully funded status in any of our divisions, that doesn't stop the, the need to continue to look and to ensure that we continue to stay in, in a very healthy financial position. So um, again, as important as it is for, for a one-year look, uh, it's it, we want to also talk about where, we, where we're seeing ourselves being over our projected period. Uh, we've been in an underfunded status for a number of years, and, and the Senate Bill 200 legislation of 2018 uh, really has some key provisions in it, which would uh, focus uh, our funding status and our benefits uh, to reaching this goal. And so that's, again, as important as a one-year snapshot is, uh, I think we really got to look at the long term. And how was last year's performance? Patrick, I think I'll take that one. Um, yeah, Para had a very strong investment performance year last year. At the end of 2019, Para's investments delivered an annualized return of 20.3% net of all fees versus our benchmark return of 19.8%. But remember, just like Ron just characterized, the CAFR ca captures the answers to these questions as of a single day, in this case, as of December 31st, 2019. In 2019, all of our asset classes had a positive return. The bond portfolio returned 9.2%. The vast majority of our portfolio is in public global equities, and that portfolio returned 29.5%. We were also able to make gains in our private asset classes, where our private, private equity portfolio returned 13.7%, real estate returned 8.4%, and the Opportunity Fund closed the year up 6.4%. Thank you, Amy. That's great news. I know a lot of members today are going to be asking questions about this year. Uh, so as a reminder, please press zero on your phone to ask a question. And Amy, what can you tell us so far about 2020? The global pandemic not only has caused a significant disruption in investment markets, it has changed our everyday lives. Para won't have official data about this year until the 2020 CAFR is compiled and audited about this time next year. However, we don't want to wait until next year to acknowledge that so many of the people responding to this crisis are Para members. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's a really key element that we want to, to mention as, as your staff here at Para. We know that it, on the front lines of this pandemic, there are a number of, of employees uh, at the state that are working on the health end of this crisis. Certainly in the, in the spring, our teacher members uh, pivoted very quickly to doing uh, remote, remote teaching, and, and there's a lot of uh, work heading forward towards the fall. So we, we very much uh, appreciate the work of our membership, and, and all of us here at the organization are very honored to, to work and serve for, for this organization and the members that we do this service for. Uh, one item I want to bring to, to attention, as Amy mentioned, the strong investment year, and in terms of how we measure how we're doing. We measure in one method is to look at how many years are each of our divisions looking at to being fully funded. How long will it take us to reaching that goal of being funded by 2047? And based on the strong investment markets of, of 2019, uh, the school, the state division, are, uh, is set to be fully funded on a projected basis in 22 years which is ahead of schedule from the, the 2047 date. Our school division at 24, also ahead of schedule. Locals at 14, our judicial division at 12, and our DPS division at 11 years. 
all fantastic news, but we do want to temper that with a conversation of, as Amy mentioned, 2020 is, is a different year. And certainly uh, the investment markets are, are volatile, what it will do in terms of our demographics and measuring. Uh, that's why it's important is to see a year and to measure where we are. Uh, we're having good news in 2019, but we do want to, to temper that a bit with we don't know what 2020 holds, and, and those numbers could move back to uh, a little further back towards reaching full funding based on 2020. We won't know that until we, we measure everything at the end of end of the year in December, uh, December 31st, 2020. And, Ron, just for the benefit of some of our listeners who are newer to PARA, can you explain what fully funded means? Absolutely. By PARA being fully funded, it means that, that the, the benefits that have been promised, the retirement benefits and the benefits earned by our members who are currently in public employment and those who are have left public employment but have left their accounts with PARA, that we have the dollars in the trust fund to pay those benefits on uh, on a projected basis at 100%. Being there doesn't mean we need to stop getting contributions because every day our members are earning new service and we need the contribution stream to, to fund those benefits as well. But uh, the, 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 the contributions that we are getting from our employers are really paying down unfunded liability. When we reach that state of being fully funded, uh, the balance of the program, we are a very inexpensive retirement option. But that's what being fully funded is, is that uh, on a basis we have the dollars in the trust fund to cover every dollar of benefits both earned uh, to our retirees who are earning benefits today and all future service that has been earned, all service has been earned by our members up to date. Thank you. And if you're just joining us, I'm Patrick with Colorado Para, and we're speaking with Para Executive Director Ron Baker and Chief Investment Officer Amy McGarity about our recently released annual report, which you can find at copara.org. And let's take a question from our audience. Our first caller is Mark from, or, I'm sorry, is Richard from Aurora. Yes, Mark. My sounds like Richard. We lost Richard. So um, take Mark. Yes, go ahead. Yes, Mark, this ahead. is question. Um, so this question is for the director. Hey, I wanted to find out if there was any changes for 2019 that they have and change in eligibility for retirement. Um, as of now, what is the minimum age to retire and what would it qualify you for? Right. Um, I, uh, thank you for the question. Unfortunately, uh, with us, there's a, a fair level of complexity to every answer that we give. Uh, simple answer on the front end is there were no changes to our benefit plan structure in 2019. Uh, as part of the reform legislation in 2018, we did, there was a new set of, we think of a tier of benefits, depending on when you were hired, that's the, it sets which, what date you can retire at and when you are eligible for a full retirement or a reduced retirement. So. Uh, unfortunately, I can't, there, are, there are a number of answers to the question of, of when you are eligible for a, a retirement and what you get from it. It really depends on when you were hired, and I would, I would uh, ask that you uh, head to the PARA website, uh, and there's a chock full of information that would be tied to your specific account. Uh, not knowing what date you were, were hired into the system, uh, I can't give you an answer as to exactly when your retirement eligibility. We have a number of those uh, different levels and tiers in our plan moving forward. So I um, appreciate the question, but there were no changes in our plan design by the General Assembly in 2019. And Ron, speaking of changes in the General Assembly, could you tell us if there are any recent changes that affect members of retirees? Uh, not from the General Assembly's perspective. Again, going back to the 2018 um, uh, le legislative reforms coming into the system, we did set up a new tier of benefits for those who were hired on January 1st, 2020. Uh, a fair number of changes on contributions coming into the system and modifications to allow us to be more flexible in terms of getting contributions in both from our members and our employers and for us to have flexibility in our benefit structure in terms of our retirement benefits. And those were the big changes in 2018. Since then, uh, nothing really has been moved forward from the General Assembly on a plan design perspective. Okay, well, thank you for that update. Let's take another caller question. And we are looking at Mark from La Junta. Mark, you are online with Ron and Amy. Hi, I was just wondering, um, as a new person to Para, um, what your guys' plan is in order to get Para back to the status that it used to be. Um, I'm in the education field, Colorado's 
known for having some of the poorest paid teachers in the state. And it, in my short time in Para, it seems like every year they keep requiring more and more money from us, but it doesn't look like we're going to get anything more at the end. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for the question, Mark. And uh, as we talked before about the benefit tiers into Para, they're, they're – uh, as folks have moved into the system, those who were hired before 2005 have a different benefit than those who have been hired post that. Uh, to your question of, of contributions coming in, every member is paying the same contributions no matter where they started into the system, with slight exceptions as to whether or not you work in law enforcement. In terms of the overall benefit, uh, the benefit formula hasn't changed for any level of, of benefit inside PARA. It's just your eligibility for what date you could retire. The basic benefit that for every year of service credit that you earn, you earn 2.5% uh, on that benefit moving forward, really means the base benefit of PARA hasn't moved, much, hasn't moved at all over time. What has just moved is, is how quickly you could retire under that structure under a full system of retirement. And uh, to, to your other question, or in, inside that question, absolutely understand that uh, the education and then the tie to the um, – cost structure of our program. The plan is to pay down the unfunded liability uh, as quickly as possible, and that does take contributions coming in. So we do have a contribution burden that is that is uh, fairly high that is paying down that unfunded liability. The member contributions um, are also being used to, to pay for the benefits moving forward. And, and I mentioned those, those dates of when we get to full funding. Last year, the school was at 34 years when we had a projected basis, now we're at 24 years. So we are making progress. The good investment year market has a lot to do with that. Uh, we had a $30 billion unfunded liability, and that does take time to pay down, and that will take contributions coming in, a, a disciplined approach to the contributions coming into the system for us to, to meet that fully funded goal. Thank you. Okay. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press zero, and you'll have an opportunity to ask the question. Our next caller, is Jessica from Denver. Jessica, you are on the line. Hi. So um, you had just mentioned something about um, 2005 making some changes to ben retirement benefits. So if you were hired in 2004, are you more or less grandfathered into the previous retirement table, or does it change each year and you have to just figure out based off of where you're at with your 20 years, 30 years, 40 years type investment uh, you bet you are you are grandfathered in your higher date uh, will determine what benefit tier that you're in and again really what those get to is how quickly you can retire under a full service retirement uh, so it, it is not each year do you need to look you find on our our charts on the para website uh, what plan design that you're in what year were you hired and that will get you to the chart to tell you when what your benefits will be at, at any age and service combination but once you are hired in unless you were to take your money out in a refund you are grandfathered into that benefit here and Ron, another funding question the general assembly recently discussed para as they were attempting to balance the state budget you know, in these unprecedented circumstances. Can you tell us what was the end result and the impact of PARA? Absolutely. Uh, as I say, the, the pandemic has had a, a dramatic impact to the state's budget. Uh, before the, the pandemic hit, the, the General Assembly was looking at a budget surplus. Uh, and coming out of the, the – when they re reconvened after going into quarantine, uh, they, they were at a $3.3 billion budget deficit in the state of Colorado. So to close that budget deficit, they certainly were looking for, for funding streams to, to close that gap, and Paris funding was certainly part of it. The, the 2018 uh, reform legislation had contribution increases as a part of that, that process going forward. And one of the items that we have inside that benefit is a $225 million direct distribution to Paramate every year. Uh, there were a lot of proposals put forth. A number of them would have uh, undermined the work that was done in 2018 in terms of the, the discipline that I mentioned earlier. I have to say the General Assembly uh, came together and really focused on keeping Para as solvent as possible. We were able to talk and, and educate them on the effect of of if not paying the contributions now, what impact that would have long term on PARA. But they did need to make some modifications to close that budget gap, and the, and the largest one was that direct distribution of $225 million. They did not, they suspended it for the 2021 fiscal year, so 
this July 1st, we didn't get those, but um, in terms of, of all the things that were being discussed, PARA came out of it probably as strong as we could have. The PARA board uh, certainly let the General Assembly know that any reductions in contributions is not where they would be as fiduciaries, but understanding that the General Assembly had a huge task ahead of them. So we came out of it with, with some reductions in contributions, but not nearly uh, the number that had been contemplated or considered as as they were just really doing a very thoughtful process about how to close a $3.3 billion budget gap. So it sounds like it was a one-time adjustment of the direct distribution. Is there a way for our audience to learn more and to stay informed about proposed legislation? Absolutely. We have a, a, uh, a blog, uh, an issues blog called Para on the Issues, and I would direct our folks that want to know more about Para legislation and really just Para's take on broad pension issues to uh, sign up for that newsletter and, and to come to that blogging and receive frequent updates on us as, as we give our take on current pension issues going on in the state of Colorado. Great. Thank you for that. And speaking of our website, uh, let's do a polling question about the website. Ian, if you would please conduct our first poll. Sure thing, Patrick. First question for our audience, and you can vote on, our, on your phone. Have you enrolled in multi-factor authentication in order to access your PARA online account information at www.copara.org? Press 1 for yes, you have enrolled in multi-factor authentication on our website. Press 2 if you have not yet enrolled in multi-factor authentication on our website. Press 3 if you have not created an online account with PARA. Again, our question, have you enrolled in multi-factor authentication in order to access your PARA online account information at copara.org? Press 1 if you have enrolled in multi-factor authentication on our website. Press 2 if you have not enrolled in authentication on our website. Press 3 if you have not created an online account with PARA. Go ahead and vote now. Back to, back to you, Patrick. Thank you, Ian. And as we tally those results, let's take a few more questions. If we could go to John from Frederick. John, uh, you are on the line. Hi. I was just wondering, what is PARA doing to minimize the losses that, like 2018, when they took those big losses from the stock portfolios, what are we doing to minimize losing that type of money again? John, I'll take that one. This is Amy McGarrity. Thank you for asking that question. The way Paris assets are allocated is dictated by the Board of Trustees Strategic Asset Allocation Policy. This policy is determined uh, approximately every five years uh, with the assistance of their external investment consultant. The objective of the asset liability study is to determine the long-term strategic asset allocation for the overall plan, which then leads into the actuarial assumed long-term rate of return, which is currently seven and a quarter percent. So as we think about the asset allocation for the plan, we think about it over a long, a very long-term time horizon sort of into perpetuity, but in general over a 30-year period. And the assumptions that the external consultant and the board uses uh, to determine the asset allocation policy are designed to deliver results over that 30-year period. So in general, we are going to be invested in, in the markets during up markets and down markets and remain invested in the markets over, over long periods of time. So as you suggested, in 2018, the fund experienced a negative return, whereas in 2019, we experienced a significantly positive return. So rather than market timing and tactically allocating the plan, the philosophy of PARA is to allocate in a strategic fashion in a way to, that is designed to outperform or to deliver that long-term rate of return over a very long-term time horizon. That said, individual asset classes and portfolios may incorporate views on current market conditions in the management of the underlying portfolios. All this is to say we are invested in the markets. We are attempting to mitigate losses during periods of market lower, down market volatility. However, as we are not market timers, we're still subject to the overall market swings and have experienced losses in our public equities portfolio year to date. I can give you some figures as to uh, year to date results in our public markets portfolios. Um, just keep in, in mind though, actually I'll be giving you benchmark returns, keep in mind that even though the vast majority of our portfolio is allocated to public markets, stocks and bonds, which are traded daily, um, minute to minute, 
and our mark to market very frequently, we have significant exposure to private assets as well, which are not marked to market daily. And in fact, we, we mark those books on a monthly and quarterly basis and, and are audited on an annual basis. So circling back around, our public markets benchmark, which is comprised of 70% global equities and 30% bonds, this is the benchmark, was down 1.1% through yesterday, where global equities were down 4.8% and bonds were up 6.5%. So again, just to reiterate, we are subject to market swings of volatility, and the strategic asset allocation is designed to perform at that around 7.25% over a very long-term time horizon. Thanks for the question. Okay, our next question is from John in Frederick regarding buyouts. Yeah, hi. I have a question about early buyout. I was told that uh, Para or, you know, the agency that I work for, Department of Corrections, might offer us an early buyout if you, you know, at a reduced rate, like buy some years to, to leave, you know, state service earlier. Is there any truth to that? Uh, thank you, John, for the question. Um, yeah, this is, this is kind of an important one because we've, we've heard this question come to our call center quite a bit. Para the association, we do not have the ability to change the benefits. Um, that is a general assembly item. We do not have the ability to modify statute that, that would set the rate for purchasing service credit. Uh, so Para is not um, offering early buyouts. Para is not offering uh, anything along that line. Para as an association can't do it. It would have to come from the general assembly. So. Um, I, th I think those, uh, unfortunately, I think I've heard those rumors that PARA is offering. Now, you also mentioned that your employer might, that that's obviously a different situation about what your employer might do, but the association, the PARA board, has no ability to modify or, or allow people to retire earlier or purchase service credit at a reduced rate. So I thank you for the question because it certainly is one that we get to our call center quite a bit recently is, that rumor is flowing through the membership that uh, PARA is offering something that we are simply simply unable to do. Okay, our next question is from Glenn in Pueblo. Glenn, you are on the line. Uh, yes, I just wanted to find out if uh, everything that's happening right now, is that going to affect anybody that's retiring in the next three to four years? Thank you, Glenn, for the question. Yeah, uh, Paris benefit plan is is not modified uh, in terms of of if you're close to retirement. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the benefit tier that you're in is is locked in based on your hire date. So if you were three years from retirement uh, yesterday, uh, it, it didn't change today in terms of our plan structure through what's what's happened through the pandemic. Our plan design is in statute and has not been modified since uh, 2018 when we had modifications that, that created a new tier of benefits and made modifications to our annual increase amount. So uh, nothing's in the works that we're aware of that would affect anybody's plan design in the next three to five years. Okay, let's go to our next caller. And that would be Faith from Broomfield. Faith, you are online. Hi there, everybody. Um, I joined Para very, very late into the game. Only got about three years in. But I've worked all my life in the private sector paying into Social Security. You hear a lot of rumors at work, oh, my gosh, this is not good, that's not good. How does this work between Social Security and Para? Great. Uh, uh, um there is an interaction with Social Security and PARA, and as you described being a late bloomer to PARA, it may mean that you've worked uh, enough quarters in Social Security to not have necessarily your Social Security benefit affected as dramatically as somebody that has less quarters. So your individual uh, circumstance may be a little less affected than what you hear from most folks. But there is a, a, an interaction between a public pension system and Social Security. There is a reduction in Social Security for... Uh, time spent in a public pension system. PARA's benefit does not get reduced, but we do have members that, that certainly had work in Social Security that when they go to get their Social Security, there is a reduction that's put in place that's done at a federal level. It's a Social Security uh, provision, not a PARA provision. So being in PARA, you'll never have your PARA benefit reduced by, by having uh, worked in jobs outside, but there is a potential 
uh, depending on how many quarters you had in Social Security to have a reduction in your Social Security. So um, as you framed it, a late bloomer, late bloomer to para may mean that you have enough quarters inside there to not be negatively affected, but there is a potential for it. Uh, I would uh, advise you to uh, certainly work with Social Security on that end of it to find out whether you have enough quarters in which the reduction is not nearly as dramatic for folks who have less quarters. Okay, I believe our first poll tally is done. And that question was, if our audience had completed the multi-factor authentication on our website, Ian, do you have those results? I sure do, yeah, thank you, Patrick. So we asked if you've enrolled in multi-factor authentication on the PARA website, that's copara.org, and for 39% of you, you said yes, you've enrolled in multi-factor authentication on our website, great to hear. 37% of you said you have not yet enrolled in multi-factor authentication on our website, and 24% said you have not yet created an online account with Para. So that's the results of our first poll. Back to you, Patrick. Thank you, Ian. And if you have not yet enrolled in these enhanced security features in order to access your Para member account online, simply go to www.copara.org and click member slash retiree login to start that process. And here you'll also find a fact sheet and a video to help guide you through the process of the multi-factor authentication. Okay, and we may not get to everyone's questions today, but we're going to get to as many as we possibly can. So with that, we'll go back to our live questions. And our next question is from Lisa in Durango. Yes, I was just wondering how and why did PARA become underfunded? Thank you, Lisa, for the question. That uh, uh, goes back over a long period of time now, uh, actually. Uh, PARA has only been fully funded, over 100% on, on a basis, three years in our entire history. But over time, as we were building up to it, we were steadily climbing towards full funding. And what happened is, uh, in the markets in the 90s, uh, the markets were, were doing really well, and, and PARA's funding climbed much quicker than, than expected, and there was a, a desire to, to increase benefits uh, at the General Assembly to um, basically have everybody share in what was happening in the markets. And when the uh, dot-com bubble burst, uh, th those benefits were basically more expensive than the dollars we had coming into the system. And since that's so from about 2001 to where we are in 2020, we've really been dealing with reforms to the system to bring us back to kind of the fiscal discipline that, that needed to be there. They just got out of out of whack in the early 90s and in the mid-90s, to be perfectly honest with you. And and so we're underfunded as we deal with those issues. There was a question earlier about buyouts. At one time, Paris sold service credit. To, there was in our statute to sell service credit at a discount, um, kind of a buyout kind of uh, an idea. That was expensive. So it's, it's a number of things where, it, kind of in effect, the benefits were – were enriched to a point that they were uh, more expensive than the contributions coming in. The contributions were reduced in that same time frame. Again, the markets were doing so well, there was uh, money wasn't put aside for, for a rainy day, in effect. And so PER has been underfunded and been really, as an organization, working with the General Assembly uh, to chip at that stone. And we really think, hope, think and hope that the reforms of Senate Bill 200 in 2018 uh, with its ability to have us move contributions and, and benefits based on our funded status will put us on a path of, of closing that gap. But it's it's a long history to, to the underfunded that we have. We've been able to pay benefits all the way through that stream, but we certainly don't have the you know the, the amount of money in the in all the trust funds that we would like to have to ensure that we have every dollar covered for every benefit that's been promised so far. But it, it really kind of ties back to a time in which uh, the markets were doing really, really, really well and the benefits were enhanced accordingly. Okay. So, Ron and Amy, the financial report that we're discussing tonight you know, is full of numbers and charts, and while that's a lot of important information to share, it only tells part of that story. Uh, PER is an organization really staffed by the people who do so many things, and this year's CAFR's themes were membership, partnership, and stewardship, trying to capture some of that sentiment. Can you share your thoughts on, on what those um, words mean and the people behind these numbers, what do they mean to the uh, para organization? Get you, Pat uh, Patrick. Uh, thank you. Um, I, um, yeah, the, 
Amy mentioned it earlier. Um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of stumbling a little bit over here because I, I really think about this quite a bit, about what, what we are and who we do this for. And, and at the end of the day, we are an association for the public workforce of the state of Colorado, and, and that is a very important thing. Uh, it is the people who are, as you all know, you're the members out there doing it. You're working for the state of Colorado. You're, you're, you're in the school districts. Um, you're, you're our ropes judges. So um, it really kind of the glue that keeps the, the state of Colorado going, and that's who we do this for, and, and we're really the association for those folks. So those, those words really, really speak to how we think about who we do the work for and who we want to be partnership, who we want to do, be partners with, um, and we are stewards of your dollars. So um, it is, it's really important to this organization. It's important to the board that you elect and, and the appointees that are, that are set by the governor's office that we take care of the folks who do good work for the state of Colorado. So that's, that's what we think about this a lot. That is really the sort of North Star that brings the folks to this building every day is that we're doing work for the folks who do the work for the state of Colorado. Thank you, Ron. And we have one more question uh, before our next poll. Uh, Lauren from Loveland, you are online with Ron and Amy. Yes, hi. Thank you for taking my call. My question, my question is regarding the um, retirement um, plans through VOIA that we can access through PARA. And I participate both in the 401k and the 457. Due to the instability right now in the market, um, I wanted to remove all of my money from the market. I was able to do that with my outside account at Vanguard, where it's just sitting on the sidelines now. Um, when I spoke to Voya, they told me that I could not do that, that the best I could do was putting it in what they call the capital preservation fund, but that in order to really just pull it out and let it sit on the sidelines through this uh, turbulent time was not possible. My question is, is that true? And if that is true, can that be fixed? Because that seems, um, seems you know, that doesn't sit well with me. Um, uh, thank you, Lauren. Uh, thank you for the question, I, and I understand uh, – uh, your frustration, and really, um, because you're an active member and, and you've and joined our plan as an active member, to, to uh, you say, put it on the sidelines, which I assume means to take it out of those accounts and move it into something else, uh, and then they'll come back into the market. Uh, that would be what's, what's referred to as an in-service distribution, and that's what Voya is telling you, that, that being an active member, that taking the money out while you're in service is where they're, where they're telling you to uh, comes problematic. So that's why they're giving you an option inside the fund to put it in something that is as safe inside the fund as can be. Your Vanguard funds are not attached to your para account, right? So you're, what you can do with those is slightly different than being an active member and having an in-service distribution in the plan design as we're setting there. So as, as frustrating as that is, uh, that's why the answer is where, is where it stands is because um, it really gets into – the rules that, that apply to you being inside an active member and being inside the para program and what penalties and such for taking a distribution while an active member. And, and Amy. Yeah, I, I would just want to add just briefly on that fund option. Uh, the Capital Preservation Fund is also known as a stable value fund. In general, it would be equivalent to, say, a short-term investment fund or a cash-type option. So I would suggest that it is one of the safest options you would have if you were simply trying to move your money to cash um, rather than be invested in the stock market. Certainly it is still subject to market volatility, but that stable value option does have some uh, guarantees around it. Um, it's, a, it's a relatively unique option that has served uh, participants in the, in the Capital Preservation Fund very well over time. So I would encourage you to, to look into that a little bit further if you are looking to move to a cash type option. Okay, and Ian, let's move to our second polling question. Would you mind introducing that? Sure thing, Patrick. Uh, PARA is always looking for ways to new ways to communicate with members. So we'd like to know, would you follow PARA on Facebook in order to stay informed on current issues affecting your retirement security? Press one for yes, you would follow PARA on Facebook to stay informed. Press two for maybe, you might look at Facebook to learn about PARA. Press three if no, you don't use Facebook or you wouldn't look for information about PARA on Facebook. You can go ahead and vote now. Again, we're wondering if you 
would follow Para on Facebook in order to stay informed on current issues affecting your retirement security. Press 1 for yes, you would follow Para on Facebook to stay informed. Press 2 for maybe you might look at Facebook to learn about Para. And press 3 for no, you don't use Facebook or wouldn't look for information about Para on Facebook. Thanks for voting in that poll. Back to you, Patrick. Okay, for those of you who are, are listening or have missed the beginning of the conversation, we are recording the conversation, and it is available on www.copera.org slash townhall. And we'd like to take a few more questions from our callers. Our next question is from Dana in Pueblo West. Uh, Dana, you are on the line. Hi. I uh, thank you for taking my call as well. Um, I hope I can remember the exact question, but my, my question was kind of like the previous lady uh, wanting to know what PARA is doing in our PARA fund to protect our money in this volatile time by placing it in safer um, options rather than the stocks and bonds and things that are traded daily that you normally do. Hi, Dan. This is Amy. I spoke earlier about the strategic asset allocation policy um, determined by the PARA board and its goal to generate a seven and a quarter percent return over a 30 year period. Within the development of that strategic asset allocation, market volatility is incorporated into that assumption. So, for example, the, the board sees a range of expected outcomes in any given year period, and they can range from very positive to very negative. And all of those individual a annual or periodic returns roll up into the 30-year, seven and a quarter percent assumption. So, in general, the strategic asset allocation is designed to weather market volatility. We all know, though, that after 2008 and again in 2018, the market volatility in the short term definitely has an impact on the funding of the plan and the automatic adjustment provision. So the PARA board is weighing the needs of the plan over the long-term 30-year period with the obvious impact of market volatility. And that is why we have the diversified strategic asset allocation that we have now. Certainly we have a very large exposure to public equity markets, private equity markets, real estate, et cetera, risk-associated markets that are designed to perform well um, in positive economic environments, positive growth environments. But we also have a lot of assets in um, asset classes that are designed to weather market downturns, like we have an allocation to fixed income, core fixed income. We have an allocation to alternatives that used to be called the opportunity fund, which has uh, assets like timber and hedge funds, which are designed to market uh, weather market downturns. So the, the asset allocation is very diversified and is designed to perform well over the long term. We are invested in the markets. We don't believe in market timing at the total fund level. All of this is to say, though, that individual portfolios in the asset allocation and asset classes may have a view on the markets that they can express in their portfolios. So, for example, if one of our equity managers is bearish on the market, uh, they can position their portfolio in alignment with the uh, policies and procedures established by para management uh, to reflect that view. So we're not, we're not ignoring the markets per se, but we are keenly focused on our objective, which is to execute on the para board of trustees strategic asset allocation. Great. Thank you, Amy. Our next question is regarding the direct distribution from the state. This is from June from Lafayette. June, you are on the line with Ron and Amy. Uh, good evening. I just had um, a question of, or a couple of questions actually all tied together about the $225 million shortfall. What is the plan to make that up? And is the portion, the five, the 0.5 percent increase in employee contribution to PARA, is that part of it? And if so, how much are we talking about as far as what will help make up that shortfall? Thank you for the question, uh, June. Yeah, I think there's some, there's some concepts in there that are that are tied together that that, that really shouldn't be, shouldn't be from the, the percent increase. The, so I'll take the contribution side. I mentioned uh, Senate Bill 200 two years ago. 
Part of that Senate bill uh, funding stream was increases in employee contributions phased in over a three-year period to, to get to have it be 2% more in contributions than the baseline that we started out in in 2018. So the contribution increase that is uh, that, that, that you're speaking of that happened this July um, is just part of that, that contribution increase and happened before uh, the, the, the pandemic or any changes this year by the General Assembly on the $225 million. So those are two, two separate things. They're just part of the contribution stream that we're implementing the provisions of what was put in place uh, two years ago. The $225 million direct distribution uh, that we didn't get this year uh, certainly uh, has an impact uh, because, you know, it's dollars not into the fund and, and those are things that we need. But um, looking at it in terms of when it we had it happen and, and the good investment return year that we just received, that we, we pay out about $4 billion in benefit payments to our retirees, actually over $4 billion in benefit payments to our retirees each year. So we're paying over $400 million a month. So that $225 million distribution, though powerful to our funding, is really covering one little over half of a month of a monthly benefit payroll to our retirees. So it, it is when I mentioned before that in terms of, of funding, it was probably the best of the of the items that could have helped hurt or have been done to close the gap by the state um, in terms of our long-term funding. It is not something we certainly would want the General Assembly to do every year. We do not want the General Assembly to think that that 225 should not be coming into PERIC because it is part of the long-term perspective of, of paying down the unfunded. So, I mean, there is really not a, a method or, a, or a, a plan in place for us to get back next year an additional $225 million. Um, we are simply uh, – it worked out in terms of our financials and having where we moved the period closer to 30 years – due to the strong investment market. So it is something that the para board will be looking at. I think uh, next year if the General Assembly has uh, another budgetary crisis, they may look to those dollars again, and we will work uh, with them to educate them on the impact that if we don't get those dollars now, uh, it, it, it's being used to pay down unfunded, and we will need those dollars in the future, and it becomes more expensive to pay down unfunded uh, on dollars with the interest being charged to it than to pay it up front, but they are balancing that against state budget items. So. I kind of a long answer, but the, the 0.5 in employee contributions and the, and the employer contributions that were tied inside the reform legislation were completely independent of the General Assembly's reaction to the budget crisis caused by the pandemic. Okay, we have the results of our second poll, which we asked you if you would use Facebook to stay informed about PARA. Ian, would you please share those results? Sure thing. So we had 22% say yes, you would follow PARA on Facebook to stay informed. 22% said maybe, you might look at Facebook to learn about PARA. And 56% said no, either you don't use Facebook or wouldn't look for information about PARA on Facebook. Thanks again for voting in those polls. Uh, back to you, Patrick. Thank you, Ian, and thanks again for being on the call with us tonight. We have time for a few more questions, so let's get back to those. Our next caller is Marjorie from Boulder. Marjorie, you are on the line. Hi. I uh, just have a question about how can we access guidance to manage and understand our personal pair accounts to make adjustments um, if we need to. For example, right now I'm looking at maybe making a bigger contribution in my 401k. So just wondering how we access that guidance to to manage our accounts and understand where where we're going to be when we retire. Thank you for the question. There are uh, options inside the VOIA, the 401k program that we offer through uh, the VOIA is the record keeper for that uh, there's a financial engines product that will allow you to, to key your information in in terms of it brings the defined benefit program uh, data in as well and can give you a, a modeling tool that will allow you to determine what kind of contribution balance that you may want to do to, to reach your goals. Um, there's also an option within there, although it does have a charge to it called managed accounts in which you can have a, a, an account person at Boya working with you to do that work. So, but there is a, there is a cost to do that. It isn't part of a, of a free program, but those are a couple of options available to, to look at getting some guidance as to what you might want to be looking at in terms of the impact of making changes to your 401k program, both contribution stream or potentially asset allocation. We have a number of tools available to, to help you with that. So hopefully, uh, you'll you'll make use of those because I think those will be pretty powerful, at least in, in helping frame what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. Our next question is regarding the benefits of PARA. It's 
Christopher from Denver. And Christopher, you are on the line with Amy and Ron. Hello. Yeah, this is uh, Chris from Denver. Thank you so much for taking my call. My um, my only question, I guess, would be is, uh, what would you say is one of the greatest benefits uh, to having para? Because I know it's it's uh, basically mandatory here in the state for the state workers, and I'm fine with that. I just want to know from uh, you know from your mouth, uh, what what would you say is the best benefit? Seeing this how it's mandated. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the question. I, I, I really appreciate you giving us a chance to talk about the value that, we, that PARA brings to the table. And uh, PARA's plan design, which is, which is going away in the, in the, in the private sector of, of a hybrid defined benefit program, simply is, is the best plan design in terms of outcomes towards replacement dollars in retirement. So yes, you are mandated as being a state employee to, to make those contributions, and those contributions are going into a fund that, that we're, we're managing professionally and working towards a benefit. And uh, back in 2014, the General Assembly asked that very question, is, is the plan design that we have in place for the state workforce the best one out there? Should we be looking at a different way to do it? And they measured the PARA plan against a number of different ways to provide retirement security. And what it came out to is that this plan design that works really for whether you end up working for state employment for one year, five years, 10 years, 30 years, that however long that you've worked here, uh, you work on a pair of employment, that the benefit that you receive uh, for the dollars that you put in is better than any other plan design out there dollar, dollar for dollar cost-wise going in. So, uh, yes, we are increasing contributions, but the value proposition in terms of what PARA is doing as a, as a savings and driver towards retirement security works across all lengths of service credit. As long as you, as if you were to work five years and leave your money in para, uh, you, sound, you sound young on the phone, so maybe a number of years before you'd be benefit eligible. We, over time, would provide interest and matching dollars on those contributions and annuitize them at retirement to give you a benefit that you cannot outlive. And uh, that is a very powerful thing. It may not feel like it to, to somebody that's first starting out in public employment, but as you as you get closer towards retirement, to know that there's a benefit there that uh, will be there every month for you that you cannot outlive um, is a very powerful thing. So um, that's what I say the value of PARA is. It really is, you know, everybody will reach a retirement eligibility age, hopefully, uh, knock on wood, and you want to have be in the best position to, to have income in retirement. Uh, to live, you know, live retirement out in dignity, and, and this plant design is simply the best one. Again, not me saying it. The General Assembly had an outside firm take a very hard look at this because they wanted to make sure they were providing the best plan that they could to the public workforce. Um, so that would be my answer: is there, there's a value to this, even if you are in public employment for a very short window of time. There is value to being in para. Thank you, Ron. Our next question is regarding furloughs. And it's from Sharon in Fort Collins. Sharon, you're on the line. Good evening. Um, I work for a university, and we are fortunate that there have not been furloughs. But my question with the uncertainty with COVID is if there were furloughs instituted, what would happen to each active member's contribution rate? Would it be prorated based on their current pay, or what would happen there? Oh, great. Thank you for the question. Um, it, it wouldn't be prorated. The contribution rate wouldn't be prorated, but the, so, but obviously the salary would be, right? So if we uh, had a furlough of, of one day a week, so that's uh, just do rough math, uh, 20% of the, the pay you don't receive, then PARA would receive 80% of your salary, and we would get contributions at the same rate that we would as a percentage going forward. So we would receive less in contributions because you were being paid less in salary. It wouldn't change the contribution rate that we're receiving. It just would change the amount of dollars coming in because there's less salary to pay on those dollars. Okay, our next question regards what do you do if you leave employment? Uh, Jenny from Denver, you are on the line. Hi, thank you for taking my call. If you leave your state job, can you take your pair of dollars with you and put it in your own private um, retirement account? Uh, thank you, Jay. Yes, you can. There, there's an option that if you're no longer in, in public employment, you can uh, refund those dollars. You can uh, roll those over to uh, to other accounts if you were to, to decide to do so. 
Um, absolutely, I would I would make the pitch that, uh, as I said, that uh, keeping it in in para for long term. But uh, if it's a better situation that when you left public employment, you wanted to consolidate your dollars, you do have that option. Once you are are not an active employer uh, employee inside public uh, inside the state workforce or a teacher. Again, the, the key element there is that you're no longer working in uh, under para covered employment. All right, we have time for a few more questions. Our next caller is Tom from Del Norte. Tom, you are on the line. Uh, hi, um, thanks for taking my call. I was just wondering if there's any plans on um, changing the reduced percentages on the um, on the scales in the next year or so. Thank you, thank you for the question, Tom. The the reduced percentages for uh, for a number of our retirees are based on a uh, again, so some, some technical work on an actual cost of, of providing the benefit. PARA will be doing an experience study here at the end of 2020, which will, uh, by doing that we will be looking at uh, um, our mortality tables and really do we need to sort of recalibrate some of the, the values that we use in our actuarials. That experience study may have some modifications to those tables going forward um, because, again, they are actuarially based. So if we were to, to, to modify some of the table amounts that are our assumptions on life expectancy, um, then I would imagine there could be some changes there, there moving forward. But not when you could retire, but the percentage that you might receive under the covers of those for those accounts that are getting an actuarial calculation, those could change based on uh, what comes out of Paris 2020 experience study. And that experience study, I talk like everybody knows what that means. Paris actuaries look at basically the, the assumptions that we have in the plan. How long do we think people are going to live? How many people will retire in a year? How many folks will refund in a year? We measure those every four years to ensure that those assumptions are, are matching reality and what we're seeing in what is happening with our members. And we re recalibrate those assumptions based on what we're seeing. So that's when I, I say experience, is we look at the experience of our membership over a four-year window and recalibrate the actuarial assumptions of what's going to happen in the next few years based on what we're seeing uh, has happened recently. So it is possible. Um, I don't think that we need dramatic changes, but there is a potential because of the experience study to see some modification to those numbers. Okay. Our next question is regarding early retirement. Our caller is Sandra from Loveland. Sandra, you are on the line. Um, good afternoon, everybody. The question I have is... Can you, if you want to, is there a penalty if you want to retire before 65 years old? And what would it be? Uh, I would, again, I would point you to uh, to our benefit chart of, of knowing where you are in terms of how much service credit you have. I wouldn't wouldn't necessarily call it a penalty before retiring it before 65. It really all depends on whether or not you've reached what we call full service eligibility, which has no reduction um, in terms of the base formula or whether you're, you're taking uh, reduced retirement, which would mean that your age and service allow you to retire, but not at the full rate. So, uh, unfortunately, I can't give you a direct answer as to what a penalty would be. Um, I, would, I would direct you to the PARA website to uh, look at your individual uh, circumstance to see what, uh, what that effect would be by retiring before age 65. Okay, we have time for one more question. It's from Donna in Colorado Springs. Donna, you are on the line with Amy and Ron. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Um, I think you kind of answered it, but I wanted to still clarify. Uh, about 25 years ago or more, you guys um, allowed people to buy in um, years at a very uh, reasonable rate, and I was wondering what was the rationale for that, and do you foresee that ever happening again? Um, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the rationale for it uh, at the time was, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a history lesson, but uh, there was a desire to uh, modify some of the state workforce in terms of who'd been there and, and was there an opportunity to, if we allowed, if we used PARA as a vehicle to have them retire, would they leave so a new, a new administration could move in a different workforce? And so. Uh, modifications were made in statute to to have para pay to have para allow purchases of service credit as uh, I, I love the way you framed it as a reasonable cost. It was at a at a pennies on the dollar cost, and it, it hurt us actuarially long term. And, and we are still feeling the impact of of not getting the dollars that we truly needed to 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 
pay for the service that was purchased. And, and the statute has been changed to say it's now an actuarial cost, which means we, we calculate what we truly believe it, it needs to be to cover the cost of that benefit. And I, I really don't see the General Assembly moving back and, and really until we close the unfunded liability doing anything that would make changes to the system that would exacerbate the unfunded liability hole. So uh, that, that's the rationale for why it was done 25 years ago. We're kind of rolling in that window, 1995, that mid-90s window when, uh, when things were over-promised and, and, and probably not paid for as well. And uh, certainly lessons have been learned over time. There was no, no way to blame. It just kind of was an irrational exuberance, I believe, was the term that's been used broadly for that. And uh, I think uh, there's a more sober thought about uh, making any modifications to the para plan design that would increase unfunded liability. And with that, we must conclude our telephone town hall. If you have questions about your account, please contact us at one 800 759 7372, or for general information, visit us online at www.copera.org. And thank you for joining us, and good night.